This is the story of Cinderella, written by a Frenchman, Charles Perrault, over 200 years ago. It's the story of a girl mistreated by her cruel stepmother and stepsisters, who finds love and happiness with a little magical help from her fairy godmother. Once upon a time, there lived a young girl named Cinderella. She lived with her stepmother and her two stepsisters in a big old house on a fine old street. Today's lesson, soup. You may begin. Now, Cinderella's stepmother was a mean-spirited and bossy woman. Uh, slow down, ladies. Slurp slower. Slurp. While she doted on her own two daughters, trying to make them into something they weren't and never would be, she kept Cinderella in rags and made her do all the work. Hi, everybody. What you doing? Well, I finished the mopping, the scrubbing, the washing, the cooking, and the dusting. I've made the beds, beat the rugs, polished the furniture, chopped the firewood, cut the grass. Oh, and re-shingled the roof. Huh. Is that all? Lady girl. Now, go clean the chimney and the oven. Yes, stepmother. When Cinderella's work was done, she would sit quietly in her room with Pierre, her faithful one-eyed dog, and Maurice, her faithful frog. Ah. Cinderella! Uh, coming, stepmother! Uh, coming! Cinderella! Oh, where is that girl? Cinderella! Oh. oh, there you are. Your sisters have been invited to a ball. Everyone will be there. Except you, Cinderella. Because you wear red. And smell funny, Cinder Clod. Cinder Clod, Cinder Clod, who's gonna dance with Cinder Clod? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cinder Clod. Now, be a good girl and help your stepsisters get ready for the ball. Yes, stepmother. So Cinderella made new dresses and new bonnets. She styled their hair polished their nails, and shined their shoes. Finally, the night of the ball arrived. Goodbye, stepmother. Goodbye, stepsisters. Enjoy the dance. Have a good time. Without me. Oh, I want to go. I want to go. Wow. Watch it, Buster. <laughs> What's the trouble, Cinderella? Huh? Who said that? I did. Oh, my. Who are you? Why, your fairy godmother, of course. So, do you want to go to the prince's ball or not? The prince's ball? I can go to the prince's ball? Oh, yes! I do want to go. I do, I do, I do! Good, because there's no time to waste. It took only a few moments of magic for Cinderella's fairy godmother to turn a pumpkin into a fine coach. Wow. Six white mice into six white horses. Six lizards into six footmen. And Maurice and Pierre into coachmen. This is wonderful. But it's no use. I can't go to the ball dressed like this. Of course not, dear. There's nothing like being a princess. Oh, this must be a dream. Right down to my glass slippers. Oh, thank you, fairy godmother. Mwah. Yes, well, there's just one catch, dear. You must be home before the clock strikes 12. If not, then poof, everything. Pumpkin, mice, frog, dog. They all return to their original form. Understand? Yes, and I promise. Home before 12. Arriving at the ball, Cinderella was met by the prince himself. Ooh. Cinderella danced and dined and had a wonderful time. Oh, I 
I'm sorry, Your Highness. I've had a wonderful time, but I really must be going. What? So soon, my love. We've only just met. Besides, it's only midnight. Midnight? Midnight? Oh, no! Kiss me, my darling. Home before twelve. Or else. Cinderella had a long walk home. The prince and the dance were now only a memory, and all that Cinderella had to remember them by was a single glass slipper. The other glass slipper was in the hands of the prince. Mm, such workmanship. Oh, glass is so fragile, so unique. I'll find this princess if I have to search the whole kingdom, and when I do, I shall marry her. And so the search began. The prince tried the glass slipper on every foot in town, but it fit no one. Finally, the prince reached the home of Cinderella. He waited patiently as the twins tried on the glass slipper. Oh, ladies, ladies! Hi, everybody. What you doing? Huh? Ah, a glass slipper! I've got it! I've got it! I've got it! Mm, at last I've found you, my little flower. Cinderella! And so the prince found his princess and his bride. Cinderella was as good as she was beautiful. She forgave her stepmother and her stepsisters for being so mean to her. Then married her stepsisters to two gentlemen of the king's court. So everyone lived happily ever after. What you are about to see are stories from South America and Africa, which will remind you of the well-known story of Cinderella. These are Cinderella stories because the main character is mistreated by her stepfamily, but finds happiness and love with a little magical help and a dropped shoe. Our first tale, Maria Cinderella, comes from Chile in South America. Long ago, on a farm in Chile, there lived a young girl named Maria. Maria's father had died, so she lived there with her stepmother and stepsister, Sofia. While Maria worked every day from dawn to dusk, Sofia simply played all day. Sofia was spoiled and very jealous of Maria, 
So whenever Maria was happy, Sophia would complain to her mother. Maria, you are wasting time. Come here. But stepmother, I was only doing my chores. Be quiet and take care of the real work around here. It seemed that no matter how hard Maria worked, there was always more work to do. You're so slow with the cleaning, Maria. Maybe you should spend time with the animals. They're as dirty as you. And every time Sophia was jealous, Maria would be punished with even more work. As time went by, taking care of the llamas became Maria's favorite task. One baby llama was very special to Maria. His mother had died, so Maria adopted him. She fed him milk and food to help him grow strong. Would you like to wear a necklace of your own? So, Maria is playing with the llamas, hmm? You run and play. I'll have a talk with Maria. Because Sophia was jealous, Maria had to leave her llamas and go to the stream and wash the family's clothes. Maria was not happy. Oh no! The clothes! I have to find them! Maria knew that if she didn't come home with the family's clothes, she would be in terrible trouble. So she set off to find them. Hello? Is anyone home? Hello, honey. Are you lost? Maria told the lady her story, how she was washing her family's clothes, how the wind came up, and how the clothes blew away in every direction. And then I started to look for them, but I found you instead. Yes, I see. Maybe I can help you, but I'm on my way to church. Do you think you could watch my children and clean my house for me? Maria agreed to take care of the children and to clean the house. She did that and more, so when the lady returned, she was very pleased. Wonderful! I'm going to give you something for doing all this work. Take these new clothes, Maria. I have something else for you. This is a magic wand. Ah! On her way home, Maria was to follow some secret instructions. When you hear a burrow bray, look down to the ground. And when a cock crows, look up to heaven. Maria followed the secret instructions, and when she did, a beautiful star fell from the heavens and perched on her forehead. When Maria returned home with the glittering star, her stepmother got very angry. So angry that she wrapped a rag around Maria's neck to hide the star's beauty. Sophia wanted a star just like Maria's, so she made her mother give her clothes to wash at the stream too. She did everything Maria had done. She lost the clothes, followed the stream, then found the house. But Sophia knew nothing about cleaning a house or taking care of children. Well, I see somebody has been busy. Sophia, I have a surprise for you. And I have some special instructions. When the cock crows, look down on the ground. And when the burrow brays, look up at the sky. So Sophia headed home. She was determined to follow the secret instructions, and she did. But instead of being covered with starlight, Sophia found herself covered with mud. Sophia, what happened to you? It's time for church and this mud just won't come off. Maria, bring me that new silk scarf. Hurry! Here, you look beautiful, Sophia. Come now. Oh, I wish I were going too. Oh, my! <laughs> Imagine Maria at church with her smudged face and tattered dress. <laughs> you stay here. Remembering her magic wand, Maria quickly transformed herself into a princess with a fine new dress to wear to church and a fine horse and carriage, and off to church she went. No 
no one at the church recognized Maria, not even her stepmother or Sophia. Maria looked so lovely that a prince decided he wanted to marry her. It was love at first sight. But it was getting late, and Maria had to rush home before her stepmother and Sophia. Maria was in such a hurry that she lost one of her golden slippers. I must find that lovely young woman. I won't rest until I do. When Maria returned home, poof, she changed everything back to normal. Her stepmother and Sophia didn't even notice her. All they talked about was the princess they had seen in church that day. Did you see the prince in church today? How about that woman? Who was she? <laughs> not have you here sweeping when the prince arrives. I'm seeking the owner of this golden slipper to be my bride. Might she live here? Because the golden slipper fits Sophia's foot so well, the prince thought Sophia was the princess he'd seen in church that day. The prince was about to make a very big mistake when suddenly Maria's magic star gave the baby llama oh. the power to speak. Sophia, Maria is the one. Maria? Who is Maria? I'm looking for the owner of this golden slipper. Her name is Maria. Are you Maria? Maria, you've always been my favorite daughter. Remember how I let you play with the llamas? So the prince found his bride, and Maria found Prince Charming. And so the prince and Maria live happily ever after. The Hausa tribe of Nigeria in Africa tells a story which is very much like Cinderella. Watch for the familiar ingredients, the mistreated stepdaughter, the handsome prince, and the shoe that reunites the two lovers in the end. There once was a farmer who was part of the Hausa tribe in Africa. The farmer had a first wife who had a daughter, and a second wife who also had a daughter. Their land was crossed by a river that was full of frogs. Here is their story. The farmer's second wife died. His first wife took in the girl, but she hated her and made her do all the chores. Every day, the girl had to walk into the bush and gather wood. She had to build a fire, and she had to cook everyone's food. Then her relatives would rush in and eat so much that they would leave only scraps for the hungry girl. She was too ashamed to eat scraps. So she threw them into the river for the frogs. The frogs were happy to eat the scraps. On the day before the great festival, she heard a loud sound. Who's there, she asked. It is I, King of the Frogs. All my frogs love you. You gave us food when we were hungry. Come here to the river tomorrow, and we will repay your kindness. The next day, the King of the Frogs was waiting. Walk into my mouth, he croaked. The girl walked in. The frog closed his mouth and went under the water. He swam and swam. When he came up, he was surrounded by other frogs. He opened his mouth again, and as she emerged, she found she had a lovely new dress. How beautiful, she exclaimed. Thank you. All the frogs admired her, but said she should be more dressed up. She should have bracelets, necklaces, earrings, and shoes, one silver and one gold. Ah, you can go to the festival now. But when the festival is over, you must depart quietly, leaving one of your shoes behind. The gold one. The festival was well underway when the maiden arrived. The chief's son noticed the girl and invited her to sit with him. And as the evening wore on, they fell in love. But the festival was ending. As the chief's son was saying goodbye to everyone, the maiden slipped off her gold shoe and quietly left. 
The chief's son was very upset, and he vowed to find her. The next day, the chief's son called everyone in the tribe together. I must find the maiden who wears this shoe. Then he had all the young women in the village try on the shoe. But it didn't fit anyone. Are there no more maidens in the village, he asked. One of the men remembered the orphan girl who worked all the time. Bring her here. As the man and the maiden approached the village, the gold shoe leaped from the chief's son's hand and jumped onto the maiden's foot. As soon as he saw that, the chief's son knew she was the maiden he loved. So the maiden and the chief's son were married. But there's more to the story. The young couple dug a beautiful well outside their hut. And the well filled with water, and the water filled with frogs. And the frogs watched over them both all the years they lived. This is the story of Rumpelstiltskin, a German tale from the Middle Ages recorded in the 19th century by the Brothers Grimm. As you will see, it tells of a young woman who must find the secret name of a magical little man if she is to keep her firstborn child. It all started with a miller who was very proud. He spent most of his time boasting. He claimed no one could grind flour finer than he could, and he said his wife baked the best pies and cakes. But more than anything, he boasted about his beautiful daughter. One day, one of the king's royal servants was at the mill buying flour for the royal bakery, and he heard the miller bragging. Thank you, sir. Yes, my daughter's without question the most beautiful girl in the kingdom, and also the most intelligent. Yes, she's very clever. Why, she's so clever, she can, she can spin straw into gold. No, she can't. Oh, yes, she can spin straw, straw like horses eat, into pure gold. Well, the royal servant knew how much the king loved gold. So when he returned to the palace, he told the king about the miller's silly boast. He said what? Oh, oh, he said his daughter could spin straw, straw like horses eat, into gold. Why, that's absurd. He was just telling tales. But I'll teach the miller not to lie, especially not lies about gold. Prepare a tower cell with a spinning wheel and a bale of straw and bring the miller's daughter to me. <laughs> we'll see if she can spin gold from straw. Your father says you know how to spin straw into gold. Ooh. Well, spin this straw into gold by sunrise, or I'll send your father to prison for telling lies. But wait! How can I spin straw into gold? Nobody can spin straw into gold. Oh, I can! Y you can? You mean, it can be done? Could you do it for me? Hmm. It's a big job. What a prize will you give me if I spin all this straw into gold for you? Oh, anything. Whatever you like. Hmm. Will you give me your charming bracelet? Yes, certainly. 
Now, may I have my prize? Oh, yes. Thank you so much. Please, do forget it. I am glad to help. Oh, it's so beautiful. I didn't know it could be done. Well, how did you... Oh, goodbye. The next morning, the king arrived, wow. expecting to find the miller's crying daughter with the untouched pile of straw. But instead... There must be some trick. I must test it again, and I'll try for more this time. Remove the gold and lock her up until I return. And so the miller's daughter spent the entire day locked up wondering what would happen to her. Later that evening, the king came back, and this time he brought with him five bales of straw. Spin this straw into gold by morning or else. What am I going to do? If only I knew how to find that kind little man. Look around. Maybe you'll find me. So, what is the problem now? The king wants me to do it again. Oh, more gold, eh? It's a big job. It's a big job. What prize will you give me if I spin all this straw into gold for you? Anything. Anything. Whatever you wish. Will you give me your fascinating silver ring? It was a gift from my mother, but I will gladly give it to you for your kindness in helping me. Now, may I have my ring, please? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. You're a very kind man. Please, think nothing of it. I am glad to help you. Oh. When the king came the next morning, he was thrilled by the sight of all the gold. He loved the gold so much that he decided not to set the miller's daughter free until she had made him the wealthiest king in the world. That evening, the king returned. This time, he brought enough straw to fill the entire chamber. If you can spin this room full of straw into gold by morning, I will make you my queen. But if you don't, you will stay locked up in this room for the rest of your life. That kind little man won't find me again. But I already found you, so... What prize will you give me if I spin all this straw into gold for you? And you become queen. Whatever you want. Anything at all. But, but I have nothing left. Oh, when you are queen, you will have much. Oh, yes. Rings and bracelets, furs and hats. You can have anything you want. Anything? Yes, anything at all. Then, it's a deal. Oh, you've done it! Oh, thank you, kind little man. And now, I will name my prize. You must give me your firstborn child. What? But, but I'm not even married. You soon will be married, and I'll wait. Amazing. Incredible. I like it. But I can hardly believe it. Your father wasn't lying. Thank you, Miller's daughter. And now you may become my wife. And they did get married. There was a grand wedding at the palace. The miller's daughter, or I should say the new queen, was so happy and overwhelmed that she forgot all about the little man and the prize he was to claim from her. She did not remember the little man even when she had her first child. But one day... <laughs> Hello, I've come to collect my prize. Is it a boy or a girl? No, no, you can't mean it. You can have anything. My 
crown, my palace, whatever you wish. But you can't take my baby. Just as I thought. But you did make a promise, and you will keep it. You have no power to break this promise. Your only hope is if you can guess my name. Your name? Yes, my name. Nobody knows what it is. And my name is the secret to my powers. Hmm, I'll give you three days. You may guess as many times as you like, but if after three days you have not guessed my name, I will take your baby. The unfortunate queen called for her most trusted messenger and sent him to make a list of every unusual name in the kingdom. Then she began reading the books in the royal library, trying to find the name that might be right. Copernicus, Da Vinci, Ptolemy, Archimedes. <gasps> Hello. Is your name Balthazar? No. Is it Engelbert? No. Aristotle nope. or Garamond? Nope. <laughs> no, not even close. Is it Rascal? The queen continued guessing for almost an hour before the little man vanished. The next day, she tried to think of silly names that the little man might use. When he appeared, she tried all the silly names. Is your name Spider Legs or Cow Ribs? <laughs> Trittitrot oh. or Whoopity Story? Oh. No, no. Please don't make me laugh. Is it Jabberwocky or Eggs Benedict or Oompa Loompa or Ewan McTeagle or Cornelius Pudding or Weebles Wobbling or Mortimer Dariample or Gervais Brook Hamster, Dingle Dangle Dongle or Throat Wobbler Mangrove? You are running out of time. Don't forget that my next visit will be my last. Oh, I don't know how I can save my baby. Your Majesty? Come in. I have returned. I traveled throughout the kingdom, my lady, but I had no success finding unusual names. But last night, I stopped to rest my horse on a hillside, and I noticed a fire flickering off in the woods. I went quietly to investigate, and through the trees, I saw the strangest little man dancing around the fire. He kept singing the same song over and over. Soon I will win a baby from the queen, and I'll make it cook and clean. She'll guess and guess, but you'll lose this game, because Rumpelstiltskin is my name. The queen's messenger had done a wonderful thing for her. She was now ready for the little man when he arrived for the last time. La, 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 la. la, 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 la. Why don't you guess? Come on. Is your name John? No. <laughs> Is it George? No. Or Steve? No. Why don't you give up now? Is your name Rumpelstiltskin? No, no. What? That's not fair! That's not fair! That's not fair! And Rumpelstiltskin was never seen again. What you are about to see are ancient tales from Norway and Israel, which will remind you of the familiar story of Rumpelstiltskin. Look for the key ingredient, a magical name which must be uttered to save the main character from a terrible fate.
there once lived a great Norwegian king named Olaf. Olaf was a Viking warrior who became a Christian and who built the first Christian churches in Norway. For his good deeds, he was made a saint. But long before he became a saint, Olaf had in mind to build a really grand church. The only trouble was, all his builders were busy building churches elsewhere. So Olaf had to figure out some other way to build this church. Hmm, he thought. I wonder if a troll could build my church. Trolls were powerful and dangerous creatures. A single troll had the strength and magic power to build a church all by itself. Olaf knew that there was an ugly troll living nearby, under a footbridge. The troll was very dangerous. Olaf knew that someday that troll would have to go. Now it's well known that every troll loves a bargain. So Olaf made a bargain with the troll. He promised that if the troll would build his church, he would give the troll the sun, the moon, and his own immortal soul. Knowing a bargain when he heard one, the troll quickly agreed. Now, Olaf was no fool. He planned to trick the troll into building the church and then destroy the monster. Month by month, as Olaf watched, the troll built the church. It was huge and had Viking dragons and Christian crosses decorating every corner. But as the months went by, Olaf couldn't think of any way to destroy the monster. Then, one day, Olaf remembered that if you say a troll's name out loud, that troll will turn to stone. That's why trolls keep their names so secret. Olaf decided to find out the troll's name. Olaf followed the troll back to his footbridge. The monster entered a gloomy cave where he lived with his trollish family. Meanwhile, Olaf hid behind a tree. Very soon, the troll's wife and baby came out of the cave. If you thought the troll was mean and ugly, you should have seen his wife. Her baby was even worse. <coughs> Olaf listened carefully. Stop your crying, little troll. Tomorrow we'll have fine new gifts to play with. Your father says he'll bring home the sun, the moon, and King Olaf's immortal soul. <laughs> if he doesn't, I'll get mad. And you know how your father, wind and weather, hates to get me mad. Aha! Wind and weather. That was the name Olaf needed to hear. He rushed home, and the very next day, just as the troll put the tip on the top of the bell tower, Olaf walked up and said, Good morning, wind and weather. When the troll heard Olaf speak his name, he roared with fear and anger. But it was too late. The troll instantly turned to stone, tumbled from the high bell tower, and smashed to pieces on the ground. And that's how St. Olaf tricked the troll and got the church built. As for the troll, well, St. Olaf was never one to waste good stone. So he gathered up the troll and built a stone marker that for years stood by the roadside, pointing the way to the church. From fifth century Israel comes the story of King David and the giant. In this story, King David escapes a dangerous predicament by invoking a name, the all-powerful name of God. You know the story of David and Goliath. How little David killed the giant with a slingshot. 
And you might know that David became a king of ancient Israel during the days of the Bible. But you probably didn't know that Goliath had a younger brother. He was bigger than Goliath and meaner. His name was Ishbi Binab. He lived in a cave in the desert. That cave was a dark and terrible place, full of snakes and bats and bones. Ishbi Binab squatted on a pile of bones, thinking up ways to get even with King David for killing his older brother. One day, while hunting, King David chased a deer right into Ishbi Binab's cave. Ishbi Binab grabbed him and chained him up. I'll get even with you for killing my brother. <laughs> Is there anything in the world that will make you let me go? If you can tell me the name of God, then I'll let you go. Nobody knows the name of God, and nobody ever will. In that case, I'll just have to throw you to my hungry lions. <laughs> Meanwhile, at the royal palace, David's friend, General Abishai, worried about the king. General Abishai summoned a thousand soldiers and a thousand horses, a thousand spear carriers and a thousand archers with bows and arrows, and they all hurried into the desert to look for King David. Inside the cave, the giant heard a clanking and a rattling and the clatter of a thousand hoofs. He looked outside and saw General Abishai with the army of Israel. He yanked King David out of the chains, dragged him out where Abishai could see him. Then he threw King David up into the air, up into the clouds. To make matters worse, the giant brought out his cage of lions so that when David finally fell down from the sky, he would land right inside the cage and be killed. They watched King David rise farther and farther into the air and at that very moment, they saw a miracle. Up in the sky, the clouds parted, and they saw God himself. God leaned forward and whispered his name to King David. Just as he started to fall to earth, David shouted to Ishbi Binab, I'll tell you the name of God. God's name is... But I don't know what King David said because no one else before or since has ever known God's name. The moment he spoke the name of God, David stopped falling and floated back to earth. When the giant heard the name of God, he knew he was beaten. He stomped on the ground, and he stomped so hard that the desert opened up, and it swallowed Ishbibinab. And that giant was never heard from again. It's a good thing the story turned out this way, because if David didn't overhear the name of God, and if he didn't escape from Ishbi Binab, then he and his wife would never have had a baby boy, and that boy would never have grown up to be wise King Solomon, and history would be different than it is today. <laughs>